Racism in the service of imperialism. George Washington likened the red savages, quote, to wolves, both being beasts of prey, though they differ in shape. While colonizing and slaughtering the people of Southwest Africa, 80,000 Herero tribesmen, 60,000 of whom were killed by the German army. Isaac Wilhelm described them as baboons. In his poem, The White Man's Burden, Rudyard Kipley refers to the Asian victims of British imperialism as half-devil, half-child, dehumanizing them and demonizing them. In 1897, Winston Churchill judged the Afghans to be dangerous and as sensible as mad dogs, fit to be treated as such. He recommended the use of poison gas. About the same time, Lloyd George, Prime Minister of England, said his government should retain the right to kill niggers was referring to Asians and Africans. Justify overseas expansion, American presidents have talked about the Anglo-Saxon obligation to uplift and civilize inferior peoples, as McKinley said of the Filipinos, as Woodrow Wilson said of just about all of Latin America. Now notice something here. We're not talking about Bubber. We're not talking about Joe Redneck. We're not talking about Archie Bunker. We're talking, these quotes are from the most eminent members of society. Governor Winthrop, George Washington, Winston Churchill, Rudyard Kipling, Lloyd George, upper class gentlemen, the leaders, the patricians, the imperialists. To this day, racist beliefs have persisted both as a cause and a justification of class race conditions. It's used to explain away racist police murder, poverty, non existent job opportunities, substandard education and housing, and discrimination in all areas of life. In other words, racism is not just an internalized personal attitude, an interpersonal attitude. It's an externalized social relation that, is continually, that continually bolsters the very conditions that make it so functional. Discussions of racism usually fix, by the way, they usually fix on attitudes, They're almost always focused on attitudes. Why do people feel that way? But we ought to keep in mind that the larger system of power and interest sustains racist attitudes. So we, we talk not only of attitudinal racism, we also talk about institutional racism. And what I'm asking also that we talk about is structural or systemic racism. <clears throat> In modern day capitalist society, racism serves a number of systemic functions. First, employers have always desired a surplus workforce. When there's full employment, when jobs go looking for workers, pay goes up. When pay goes up, you cut into profit margins. But <clears throat> When workers are in superabundant supply in an overcrowded job market, then wages can be kept down. For generations, and the way to keep wages down and have that oversupply is to have what Marx called the reserve army of labor. And for generations, women, children, immigrants served in that reserve army of labor, increasing the competition for jobs and depressing wages, and so too have people of color. By keeping African Americans and Latinos in this kind of ethnically, ethnically delineated underclass, racism can secure that reserve <coughs> army. Um, you know, Bush is criticized for doing nothing for the economy. And it might seem so, given our enormous problems. And I, and I, think, of, um, I think of what Cardinal Richelieu said over 300 years ago. Cardinal Richelieu said, the power to do nothing is great, but it must not be abused. Um, <coughs> yet I would... But I would suggest that Bush is doing exactly what he wants to do according to his class interests. Free trade, recession. He doesn't get around to a job program because he doesn't want a job program. He's leading in the way he wants to lead. That's his dilemma. Otherwise, he could start doing all these things and win votes and all that sort of thing. It's not what he wants to represent. <clears throat> Another function of racism is by keeping a permanent underclass that who does the dirty work of society the toughest, mindless, lowest paying jobs. Um, what you have is rather than the normal rate of exploitation, you have what some theorists call super exploitation, which allows the investor to accumulate wealth at an even greater rate of return on an especially disadvantaged sector of the workforce. The same conditions I said before, if super exploitation obtain in the third world, which is why they want free trade to get themselves open to have access to the Mexican labor market. Racism, by the way, also helps keep the working class fragmented and disorganized. The owners and bosses are safest when the workers are busy fighting each other for crumbs rather than uniting for a larger slice of the pie. <clears throat> and by the way, economic elites are aware of this and they consciously propagate this. Well, what do you have, a conspiracy theory, Parenti? Here we go again, you know. 
No, no, I don't have a conspiracy theory. George Bush ran those Willie Horton ads as a way of bringing us together. George Bush harps and attacks affirmative action and quotas and inner city crime. He does those things to bring us together. Yes, they consciously do that. And you want to call that conspiracy? Call it conspiracy. I don't know what you mean by conspiracy. They consciously pursue their interests just as other people might. The minute you ascribe human agency to the elite elements in society, someone considers you propagator of conspiracy theory. His, by the way, rulers have always done that. The Habsburg Empire played off one nationality against another. That's how it survived through the, right up until 1914 or whatever. Plato and Aristotle stressed the desirability. Plato in his laws, Aristotle in politics, stressed the desirability of importing slaves of different nationalities and languages as a necessary means of preventing them from getting together in rebellion. Aristotle, quote, the husbandmen should all, by all means, be slaves, but, of the, but, not, but not of the same nation, for thus they would be laborious in their business and safe from attempting any novelties. <clears throat> European invaders of Africa and North America use bribes, deceptions, threats, gifts of firearms to play off tribes against tribes. It's not a conspiracy theory, it's a conspiracy actuality. So racism is usually seen as an aberrant, uh, grotesque offshoot from what is a basically rational society. What I'm arguing here is the other way around. It's a rational output from a basically aberrant and distorted society.